You can, you can start. Yeah, hi, so this is a live session where I'll be answering questions and queries or comments if you have any on the course entitled Introduction to Cultural Studies, which is the NPTO course that I'm teaching. And I have with me the two TAs for the course, Shiva Shiroi and Lakshman Chetra, who are very kindly accompanying me uh, in this session. So I'm happy to take questions if you have any, and uh, we'll make it as interactive as possible. So we've got a question, which is uh, the material which is, you want to read off? Yeah, so yeah. the material which is available in NPTEL office has more number of pages slash PDF. Mm -hmm. May I get the reference material from Google? What will be the difference between the videos available in the NPTEL course and Google materials? Yeah, but there shouldn't be a problem actually, because um, the pagination would not matter so much. I mean, you don't have to cite the number of pages or exact page number while you're answering questions. Because and most of the questions, would be quite conceptual in quality, right? So it doesn't really matter if you get it from some other source. Uh, so you, I think it's perfectly fine if you download it from Google or any other source, or if you have any library book that you can use, uh, which is the same text, but so it doesn't really matter where you're downloading it from. So, yeah. Okay, so someone is asking about not enough clarity on Baba. Okay. Uh, elaborate on that. Okay, so uh, in terms of I mean, if you have any conceptual confusion or you want a repetition of some things which have been covered, uh, feel free to write in the NPTEL forum that we have for this course. And uh, either me or my TAs will be very happy to respond to you. So if you have any specific questions about any topic, uh, whether it's a full term strategy, whether it's a question of mimicry, uh, the question of uh, my message, identity, uh, power politics, uh, whatever maybe the question that you have in mind, uh, feel free to frame it uh, in a proper question and put it in the NPTEL forum for the course, the online forum which we have. Uh, I think people can ask questions there, right? Yeah, yes. yeah. okay. So just phrase your question specifically. I'm very happy to respond to you uh, as best we can. Okay, so the next question is, uh, please explain Butler in simple language. Reading the reference material obfuscates the issues more. Okay, so again, I mean, as I just mentioned in my response to the earlier question, uh, if you have a specific topic in Butler that you want uh, clarification or a rephrasing or a revisiting, I mean, feel free to mention the topic, uh, mention a specific issue, and we be very, very happy to get back to you. I mean, obviously, the whole point about, uh, I mean, the things that we have touched upon and um, sort of elaborated while we are covering uh, gender trouble was the idea of performativity, the idea of performing uh, gender to uh, embodiment, to sartorial codes, to different kinds of signifiers, uh, and how that, that kind of performance navigates and relates to the society around the particular person. So the question of identity, the question of power, the question of production of identity, these become very important issues uh, in Bhakta, specifically when you're looking at gender trouble. So this is the, uh, a, a very short summary of what we did in the Bhakta uh, material. But again, like I said, if you have any specific questions which may not have been covered sufficiently during my lectures, uh, feel free to phrase it uh, in the form of a question. And I'll be very happy to respond to it as best I can in the end of question answer forum that we have. So just be as specific as possible and I'll do my best. So someone from the chemical engineering department asks, how important is this course for chemical engineers? Yeah, I wouldn't get your upside too much. I mean, it, it could be interesting for you in terms of looking at uh, how identities are produced in society, uh, how politics plays a role in terms of people's identities, how, you know, Performance becomes a very important factor, but these are uh, these are fairly questions based on humanities and social sciences. So I don't imagine this would be directly germane to your you know, course of study. So if you're a chemical engineer, if you're involved in chemistry, then I don't think this is directly related to what you do uh, academically. If I'm being honest here. Yeah. So someone is asking, how does Butler understand the presentation? Yeah, so the question of representation is a key question in Butler. I mean, representation can take many forms. Uh, you can represent identities through the body, uh, through a dress code, uh, through subversion of identities, subversion of hegemonic identities. So representation, I mean, if you put a hyphen between re and presentation, that simplifies things a little bit. So you're representing something, and that representing something is, is a bit like reiteration. 
So every act, every gender-based activity becomes a reiteration in its own way. And that reiteration could be linguistic, it could be sartorial, it could be embodied, it could be ideological. So, you know, every act of gender, I mean, gender, of course, is a verb in Butler, as I may have mentioned already in my lectures, it's an activity. And every act of gender, every act of performing gender becomes an act of representation. So no two gender identities are the same. So every identity is represented. And every act of representation is, a, you know, it creates a difference uh, from the original act. So, you know, it's deliberately inauthentic, it's deliberately, you know, it can be subversive, it may not be subversive, but inauthenticity becomes a key condition in representation because it moves away from any idea of original identity. There's no original identity in Butler at all. So representation becomes an act of subverting any idea of originality. Uh, that's the whole point in Butler's gender trouble. There's no original gender. It all becomes an activity-based performance. And hence representation becomes a crucial category in Butler's gender trouble. So another learner of ours has asked, what is cultural pattern? You could... Yeah, it's a very generic thing. I mean, cultural patterns could be various things. It could be patterns of power. It could be patterns of identity. It could be patterns within one particular identity. I mean, let's say, uh, you know, the idea of masculinity or femininity at any given point of time. Uh, those follow certain patterns. And obviously, those patterns are very, very heavily coded culturally. It, it corresponds to certain cultural codes at that given point of time. And these codes change. And of course, the codes are you know, quite material in quality. So many factors come into play, like economy, religion, language, ideology, uh, you know, race. So all these things come into play quite you know, complexly in the formation of codes. So cultural pattern refers to those codes of behavior, those codes of cultural representation, those codes of consistency, which are uh, operative at any given point of time. So temporality becomes a very important factor in cultural pattern because you know, it changes with time. Uh, for instance, if you take the question, the issue of femininity or masculinity, the idea of a certain kind of masculinity may be hegemonic or maybe dominant at a certain point of time, depending on the historical conditions, depending on the material conditions, the economic conditions. So these become, these inform the cultural patterns. So cultural patterns may be fairly described as a course of behavior, the course of culture, which determine the dominant and the marginalized identities at any given point of time. And these are subject to change. So these are very mutable categories, as I may have mentioned already. So, uh... Another learner is asking, hello sir, kindly explain the difference between parody and pastiche with examples. Yeah, I mean, let's say the question of the drag uh, in Butler would be a very good example. So what pastiche does, pastiche has no idea of uh, originality. I mean, parody, it has some kind of a residual nostalgia for originality, right? Well, as pastiche moves away from any nostalgia of originality. There's no originality at all. There's no acknowledgement of originality in pastiche. So in a case of Butler, in a case of the drag, the example of the drag in Butler, it becomes more of a pastiche-based performance, right? Because the entire idea of original identity, the original gender identity is done away with. There's no acknowledgement, there's no um, you know, articulation of any idea of originality. There's a key ontological difference between pastiche and parody. It's a parody, it could be subversive, but at the same time, despite a subversion, it has a residual longing, a residual nostalgia for some kind of originality which may or may not be there. Whereas pastiche completely unacknowledges the idea of originality. So a drag in Butler would be a very important example of the difference between parody and pastiche. And of course, a drag happens to be a pastiche-based performance in Butler. So there's another question uh, where they're asking to explain the concept of aporia. Okay, so aporia is obviously, it comes from the Derridean idea of deconstruction, and it was made famous by Gatvis Piva. So aporia can be defined as a liminal space between two ontological orders, right? So that space which cannot be defined properly. Uh, it could be a temporal quality, it could be a spatial quality, it could be uh, a quality of meaning production. So it's essentially the phase between two ontological orders, which cannot be defined properly. So aporia is a, is a contingent condition. That could be a practical definition of prayer. It's a contingent condition. It's a complex contingent condition, which defies any definition. So it becomes obviously a very important symbol in deconstruction, uh, in postmodernism, in Butler's gender trouble, etc. Okay, so I think someone is having a difficulty in uh, understanding the basic outline between Baba and Judith Butler. Okay. So if you could elaborate on that, the basic concepts um, in, in short. Okay, so yeah. a summary of Bhava and a summary of Butler, or the difference between the two? Uh, no, a summary of Bhava and Butler individually. Right? Okay. The person just wanted to clarify the basic concepts. Right, so. yeah. So the way we draw on Bhava for the purpose of our course, obviously Bhava 
is important because he problematizes the entire binary of colonizer and colonized. So what Harvard does essentially is, and this may help the person who asks, uh, who sort of had a question about Bhava in terms of explaining Bhava and in terms of making Bhava more uh, accessible. So this might relate to that question as well. So essentially what Bhava does, he questions the entire uh, duality, the dualism between the colonizer and the colonized. So it looks at power as a very complex performance, as a very complex phenomenon. So he says, essentially, that power doesn't really rest entirely on the colonizer. So it's not as if the colonizer is entirely powerful and the colonizer is entirely powerless. It's not as simplistic as that. And it moves away from that kind of a simplistic position and offers a more complex position, whereas uh, power becomes something, an act of negotiation, right? So. The question of mimicry becomes a very important issue in Bhava because mimicry is some kind, and this is how Bhava relates to Batla, because mimicry is an act of appropriation. But the act of appropriation is always incomplete appropriation. So it can never be an authentic or complete appropriation. So when the colonized appropriates the colonizer's uh, behavior, and when the colonized appropriates the colonizer's code of conduct, what he or she is essentially doing is not authentically mimicking the colonizer, but actually approximating the behavior of the colonizer and there's always a gap between what is represented and the original identity and this gap actually can create subversion can create parody can create prestige etc so there are different micro models of power uh, in the in the colonial setting that power talks about so it's not as if the power is entirely with the machinery of the colonized uh, uh, colonizer and, and the colonizer be colonized being entirely powerless uh, but whereas power becomes more of a micro activity of subversion reputation so power becomes a very very complex phenomenon and that's why power is important for us today and in a way if you read uh, you know the other question which we did i mean power critiques to a certain extent the entire idea of edward said where said talks about uh, the entire orientalism discourse or some kind of a binary of discourse where uh, the tools of representation the power of representation lies entirely in the colonizer whereas the colonized becomes solely represented by the colonized so there's no agency at all uh, you know, in the colonized uh, you know, perspective, whereas power makes it more complex. And power says, you know, the colonized can actually have some micro models of agency available uh, to them. And those agency can be enacted uh, through acts of subversion, through acts of dressing, through acts of speaking, through acts of linguistic appropriation, etc. So in that sense, it becomes quite interesting. And of course, then power offers us a very important model, the fourth term strategy. Uh, if you remember, where uh, aggression, narcissism, metaphor, metonymy, these become very important activities, right? So metaphor and metonymy both uh, are pointers to some kind of incomplete appropriation. So if you metonymize something, you are basically fragmenting the certain things. So fragmentation becomes a very important uh, element in Bhava's analysis of colonial power discourse. And if you take this and come to Butler, which is part of your question as well, I believe. So even in Butler, we find that entire idea of authentic imitation becomes uh, redundant really. There's no such thing as authentic imitation. So every act of imitation is inauthentic. So it's representation. And this is again maybe related to the question which came in a bit earlier, the question of representation as it comes in Butler. So every act of representation is, uh, is, is a temporal activity. It happens after the original act has been done or made. So every act of representation becomes an inauthentic reputation of the original. And of course, if you push it too far, uh, when it comes to Butler, the whole idea can become a pastiche, but the entire ontology of originality goes you know, down the drain. So there's no originality left at all. So every act becomes an act of reputation uh, without any original ontology at all. So in a way, we find that both Butler and Bhava, they talk about fragmentation quite a lot. They talk about contingency quite a lot. So complex, contingent, fragmented performances become important uh, in the case of Butler as well as for Bhava. So I don't, I don't know if this is entirely helpful, but if you have any further questions which are more specific in quality, uh, feel free to write those questions down in the online forum which we have and we happy to respond to it. So a learner would like to choose current trends and writers in cultural studies related with literature. So she's asked this, Ishwari is asking for suggestions from you. Yeah, so I'm not entirely sure what you're looking for. I mean, looking for literary texts which are helpful in terms of looking at cultural studies. Are you looking at uh, some of the key figures which who can straddle literature as well as uh, cultural studies. If you're looking for the latter, uh, then of course Butler would be a very good figure because Butler keeps drawing on literary examples uh, in her text. And of course, Bhava could also be a good example as well because you know, even Bhava talks about some literary texts uh, in other essays as well. But if you're looking for works of literature which may be helpful in terms of understanding cultural studies, I mean, you can start with uh, something as basic and something as uh, ancient as Robinson Crusoe, uh, which becomes a very important allegory of imperialism. So if you read Robinson Crusoe, which is a, 
work of fiction, of course, is a novel, one of the earliest novels written in English language. You find the entire idea of Robinson Crusoe going to the island, taking over the island, setting up a plantation. Uh, these could be read uh, through the lenses of colonial studies quite effectively uh, as an allegory of the white man's territorialization, taking over the territory in a non-white space. And not just that, of course, the question of Friday becomes very important. Uh, the original inhabitant of the island, uh, who is given a name by the white man, who is given an identity by the white man, who is conferred an identity by the white man, conferred a religion, conferred a language, conferred an agency. In other words, he is given personhood by the white man. So the entire idea of personhood becomes quite complex in Robinson Crusoe. So, you know, you can start with something like Robinson Crusoe. And of course, there are more recent examples. We'll talk about the more postmodern texts, uh, the more colonial texts. I mean, White City Associ, for instance. Uh, Jane Coyne's Four, for instance, which is actually a revision of Robinson Crusoe. And then, of course, the more canonical postmodern texts, such as Amand Rashid's Midnight's Children, uh, you know, which is obviously takes all the boxes in terms of being postmodern and postcolonial as well. And then, of course, uh, if you're more interested in a postmodern gender based uh, study, uh, Angela Carter could be a very good example uh, of, of a writer who does that. So, again, if you have more specific questions, more pointed questions, and you need more references in terms of figures who may be helpful for your study, feel free to write about it in the online forum and I'm happy to get back to you. So, a lot of students have yeah. a lot of queries about uh, the examination just uh, to be held. So, yeah. they're asking about exam PDF material states that the text and the lecture states the interpretation and analysis. Is yeah. it important to look for the critical analysis for main exam? Uh, what I would suggest is if you just listen to lectures and respond to the lectures in a way that you're doing at the moment, and if you're writing in an online forum as well, that's just about it, really. You don't really refer to any critical analysis outside the lectures. So nothing which has not been mentioned will appear in examination. Of course, it's going to be an objective-based uh, examination, but there will also be a subjective section where we're required to write, uh, not essay type, perhaps, but maybe uh, five-sentence answers, which are conceptual in, in, in quality. So it's going to be a test of your you know, writing ability. It's going to be a test of your conceptual clarity, et cetera. But like I said, I mean, nothing which has not been mentioned uh, in the lectures uh, will appear in examination. Just pay attention to the lectures the way it has been sort of conveyed to you. And if you have any questions based on the lectures, uh, feel free to ask me either here uh, in the coming live sessions or in the online forum, which we have already. But then, yeah, I mean, just attend the lectures as best you can. I mean, the lectures contain all the content which will appear in the form of questions and examination. Uh, I mean, that's about it, really. I mean, there's nothing outside the lecture in terms of content which you need to be worried about in terms of preparing for the examination. Uh, just follow the content as closely as you can. If you have difficulties with the content, either in the way it's represented to you or in terms of any conceptual thing which you thought may not wasn't unpacked sufficiently, uh, feel free to write about it. But just be as pointed as possible. Just be as specific as possible in terms of asking your questions. Uh, that will help me as well to respond to your questions. Of course, I have my TAs who are very, very helpful. And they'll be able to help you as well in terms of uh, any specific queries which you may have. So, a learner is asking to list the differences between structuralism and deconstruction. Yeah, I mean, these are very key uh, categories, actually. I mean, structuralism, I mean, deconstruction is basically a post structuralism. So, if I put it in very bluntly, that's probably going to be the most perfect example, the most perfect uh, definition of deconstruction. So, deconstruction and post structuralism are almost simultaneous historically as well as theoretically. Right. So, uh, structuralism has, I mean, if you go back to something like uh, Ferdinand and Cezor, one of the founding figures of structuralism. So structuralism, uh, it entails a linear, logical, causal relationship between signifier and signifier it. So for instance, if I say the word cat, C-A-T, uh, that's a signifier I'm giving you. And the moment we hear the word cat, we have an image of the cat in your mind. That's a signifier it. Now, structuralism connects the signifier and the signifier in a very causal, logical way. Whereas post-structuralism questions this causal qu quality. Uh, Post-structuralism questions this logical assumption. So post-structuralism breaks away from any easy assumption, from any easy question to the signifier and the signifier it. And in that sense, it makes the entire semantics more problematic in quality. Uh, the entire uh, presuppositions and language become more problematic in post-structuralism. And deconstruction comes in along with post-structuralism, where um, the key thing in deconstruction is meaning is always deferred and differed. So the very famous Derridan example of difference 
which is a combination of uh, differing and differing. So unlike structuralism, which has an easy question between the signifier and the signified, where the meaning is always already available and accessible to you, uh, deconstruction questions this assumption of accessibility. And it actually says meaning is always deferred and deferred. So the question of aporia, which someone asked a few while ago, might be very, very important over here because aporia is a very key category in deconstruction. Of course, people are who translated Derrida uh, into the Anglophone uh, academia. I mean, she made aporia famous in her writings. But the key thing is uh, meanings have always passed through aporia. Uh, meanings have an aporiatic quality in the sense that uh, they're always differing and differing from any idea of originality. So deconstruction does away with any idea of originality, whereas structuralism presupposes an idea of originality, an idea of ontological logic between signifier and signified. So structuralism is more structured when it comes to uh, the production of meaning and the reception of meanings, whereas deconstruction uh, lets go of the structure or destructures the structure and opens up plural possibilities. And this brings me to another very important issue. I mean, there are certain occasions when we mistakenly or erroneously think of deconstruction as destruction, but it's actually just the opposite. I mean, deconstruction is the production of plural possibilities. So it's actually a making of more meanings rather than a destruction of meanings. So that's something uh, we need to be aware of. And if you're looking for a figure uh, who sort of defines this difference very clearly between destruction and deconstruction, the American deconstructionist uh, Barbara Johnson would be a very good figure uh, to look at in terms of reference. So um, currently we don't have any questions from the learners. If you would like to talk a few things about the course, the basic things that the learners need to know about for entering uh, and uh, going ahead with the yeah course. yeah so let's have a discussion then shall we i mean because uh, the three uh, the tiers i have with me at the moment i mean they've been uh, definitely very inception of the course so we can have a very generic discussion uh, in terms of the elements of the course uh, the generic elements of the course and what are the key categories that one should be aware of uh, in this course in cultural studies if i could just have a chat with the tas that might sort of help us you know trigger more questions uh, at some point later so i believe identity is a very key category in uh, this entire business of cultural studies so how do you think identity plays out in a course like this if i could just ask you very generically um, i think it's very loaded like yeah identity is always very loaded we yeah. always have quotes attached to identities yeah. and uh, yeah um just like uh you want to add like I think we have we have been discussing about yeah. our identity. Exactly, yeah. Like, mm. and and yes, and yes. Are, and it's constantly changing also, yeah. I think, because uh, there's a degree of elasticity in mm -hmm. identity mm -hmm. because uh, if and recently identity itself is I think we have discussed that in our lectures. Yeah. Like how identity itself is a process, like yeah, how yeah. identification is a process sure. rather than yeah. uh, abstract. Yeah. Exactly. I mean, this probably relates to a question which came a bit earlier about uh, patterns of culture. I think because identities are produced out of patterns of culture. And of course, production is a very loaded term in cultural studies because every act of production is often always an act of reproduction. Right. Uh, so identities are produced through economic, material, textual processes, but also through experiential processes. Right. And of course, all these processes are very mutable in quality. And like Lakshmi said, uh, that, you know, the whole point of identity is uh, it always is an act of approximation uh, rather than an act of you know some kind of frozen uh, ossified category it becomes an act of approximation which then opens up to different acts of subversion as well so identities can be political linguistic embodied gendered uh, cultural of course you know racial of course if you're reading fano for instance uh, he makes a very interesting discourse about identities uh, as this real experience uh, in a colonial reified condition where your status as a black man uh, presupposes. I mean, that precedes you in a way. So, you know, your blackness precedes your every other form of identity. You know? And if you're a French-speaking black man, then you obviously subject to different kinds of questions about your knowledge of French, uh, how can you speak French so well, etc. So, identities become very, very important. Uh, and actually, she said, elastic categories. So, elasticity in identity is something that we've been interested in throughout this course uh, in cultural studies. So, that's probably one of the things that we'll keep coming back to. It's like a recursive marker. Uh, in cultural studies, as is power, uh, for instance. I mean, uh, so if I just ask the next question about power, and how is power uh, interesting as uh, not so much a product, but a performance uh, in a course like cultural studies, and how do you respond to it in terms of the text that we are covered? So, let's say shooting elephants by Owen. So, um, I think it's 
So um, yeah, I think power, as we always understood, we uh, we consider that the power is uh, some someone who will always act out yeah. and like to have dominance over. Yeah. But here we also see how text can produce power, like in, yeah. in sort of like epistemological. Uh, knowledge uh, production so uh, and if we focus on the oral essay uh, yeah. we look at how uh, there the entire uh, discourse of power changes because here the powerful is also powerless at one one point of time sure yeah and um, so yeah i think there's a so like our idea about how power is related to authority changes like yeah. we learn how power is also like power itself is more uh, distributed rather than yeah we understood it Absolutely. Yeah, exactly. And of course, Foucault is a very key uh, figure in the entire discourse in power politics, biomedicine. And of course, he's got a, I mean, we've dealt with one of his essays as well, What is an Author, where he talks about the entire equation between writing and the production of authority, and the, how, the, how that becomes, like Lakshmi said, distributed in quality rather than uh, sort of centralized in quality. And of course, if we take a look at the Oval essay, as Shoshin said, the entire ontology of powerfulness cracks up, really, because the powerful realizes is actually powerless because it's required to be powerful all the time and in that requirement lies the reification so he's reified uh, he's commodified as a powerful product and there's no other option apart from appearing powerful apart from enacting power all the time so that in a paradoxical way makes him powerless so that essay really opens up uh, it's a very delicious deconstruction in a way of the entire assumptions about power the entire presuppositions of power in the colonial space and that in a way becomes a nice uh, enactment of what power says in this essay uh, that power doesn't rest entirely with the colonizer, but actually it becomes a, a microactivity, uh, different forms of negotiations come into being. So one might argue that if you're reading the Orwell essay, the Burmese crowd waiting behind him are actually more powerful than a man Orwell because they force him to do something which he doesn't want to do in the first place. So the entire politics of power becomes quite complex and quite distributed in quality. And that's something which we've been talking about throughout the school, some different uh, texts that we've covered, whether it's Butler, Orwell, uh, Hava, and also Fano for the matter. So it all becomes uh, quite interesting. So uh, a student is a learner is asking law as a part of grand narrative of the state. How do you co how do postmodernism approach the legal system? Yeah. So if you look at Lyotard, for instance, the entire idea of postmodern tradition, I mean, uh, is very suspicious of any grand narratives. Uh, so law with a capital L, law as a grand narrative, is obviously becomes uh, open for attack uh, when it comes to postmodernism because postmodernism is more interested in micro narratives uh, of negotiation, micro narratives of power, micro narratives of legality, etc. So law as a grand narrative then becomes a problem in a postmodern perspective uh, because it then relates to the idea of public space, it then relates to the idea of hegemonic identity, it then relates to the idea of dominance, etc., which can become quite totalitarian in quality. So law is obviously one of the grand narratives, like nation, like language, like culture, which postmodernism keeps questioning to different forms and different um, acts of subversion. So law is an important category in postmodernism, I believe. So uh, there's also a, uh, a learner asking, will there be a pen and paper exam or online? Will it be multiple choice type? like the assignments? Yeah, I mean, it's going to be a combination of multiple choice and uh, subjective questions. So like I said, you're required to, obviously, I mean, the bulk of the questions will be multiple choice, MCQs. But then it'll also be a section where we're required to write uh, short answers. Uh, so those, again, will be very conceptual questions related to the essays which have been covered, related to the content which have been covered in the videos. So again, like I said, there's nothing outside what has been covered in the videos will appear in some way. So just follow the content as closely as you can. Um, and in terms of what I'm looking for, what we're looking for in evaluating uh, those questions is A, your conceptual clarity, and B, your writing ability. So ideally, we're looking for a combination of both. Uh, so it need to be conceptually clear, conceptually correct, and, and ideally elegant in terms of how you represent what you're writing. Uh, so that's probably the, the key thing we're looking at in terms of the uh, little subjective questions which will appear and the two main examinations which are there as part of the schools. Okay, right. So in terms of the uh, course, of course, I mean, 
there's going to be a series of uh, weekly assignments, which I think have started already. Uh, so those of you um, who attended the course will be uh, looking at the weekly assignments. And again, the weekly assignments are part of what has been taught already in terms of the content. Uh, so each week will have a certain content which has been covered and the questions will come from those content. So that's part of one kind of evaluation. And of course, there'll be two centralized examinations uh, of 100 marks. So it's going to be, again, the bulk of it will be MCQs, uh, multiple choice questions. Uh, and then, of course, it's going to be uh, uh, more, uh, a certain part of it will be subjective as well uh, in terms of your know, testing your writing ability and your conceptual clarity. So it's going to be a combination of weekly assignments and uh, two centralized examinations in terms of evaluation for the schools. So a student has been persistently asking about the importance and the relevance of the schools in a process industries. So would you like to explain to us, if in Hindi, possibly? Yeah, in my Hindi is quite atrocious, actually. So I wouldn't embarrass myself. But uh, in terms of responding to your question about uh, the relevance of this course and process industry, again, I'll be honest, I don't see a direct relevance in terms of how it will affect you immediately uh, in terms of what you do. But it might help you in terms of getting a more uh, complex understanding of the commodity, if that's what you're interested in, and the whole idea of converting an object into a commodity to different forms of packaging, to different forms of processing, uh, to different forms of classification. So that could be potentially interesting for you. But again, like you said, if I had to be honest with you entirely, I don't think there's any direct relevance in terms of what you do uh, with the content on this course. So it's not going to be a need-based thing. So I hope that addresses the question. So Lona just wants to clarify, yeah. uh, did he hear it right? Uh, two main examinations in the course. No, I mean, it's going to be two examinations. So, of course, it's going to be part of uh, one examination. So, either going to be in the, uh, so it's going to be part of one day. So, there's going to be an examination in the morning and one in the evening. And that's going to be branched out depending on your availability. Right. So, it's going to be one examination essentially. There'll be two question papers, but each one of you would have to pay up for one examination, not two. So, there'll be two separate question papers altogether. So, again, if you have more specific questions about the nature of question papers, the nature of questions which you might expect, uh, feel free to write to us in the online forum and we'll respond to you as quickly as we can. But like I said, the bulk of the questions in the MCQs, uh, there will be a little subsection where it's slightly more subjective, where I need to write a little bit. Again, those questions will be con completely conceptual and, and quality and it will test your conceptual clarity more than anything else. I think some of our learners would like to know how uh, this course would help them to prepare for PhD in national conferences. Yeah. Yeah. So yeah. I mean, if you're coming from a literature background, or if you're aiming to do a PhD on literature or interface with literature and cultural studies, and also to a certain extent on political science or gender studies for the matter, I think this course might be helpful, uh, at least uh, as a basic beginning uh, of that kind of a research uh, program. Because what we're doing in this course, we're taking some pre canonical texts like Orwell, uh, Said, you know, uh, then Fanon, then Lyotard, Foucault, some of the very canonical figures in cultural studies as well as in literature, literary studies, literary theory. So this could be a very nice uh, foundation for those of us interested uh, to pursue high studies, either through a form of a PhD or an MPhil or just as a, you know, someone preparing for conferences. So this will give you the right degree of theoretical expertise, uh, you know, ideally, uh, if you are to aim for conferences if you're drawing on things that is cultural studies or literature, or looking at interface with literature and cultural studies. So in that sense, it could be helpful. And again, uh, one of the things I've been very conscious of while I was uh, trying to be a resource person for this course is the language uh, through which the, the, the lectures have been conveyed. So language is quite uh, theoretical in quality, if you, uh, if you notice. So that's a very deliberate way uh, I've designed it, just so uh, you pick up the theoretical quality of language which you don't mind replicate while you're writing. Uh, for a conference paper or you're presenting a paper in a conference because it's very important to get a theoretical quality in language in terms of communicating what you're saying at a conceptual level so i think uh, the level of content uh in terms of the, the content covered in the course that might be helpful for you for your conferences and for your phd and also the level of form and the way the language has been used in this course that might be helpful for you as well in terms of how you use theoretical language how you use high theory language uh in terms of conveying your points so it could be doubly useful in that way ideally That's more or less it.
Yeah, so uh, like I said, this is the first of the many live sessions we'll have, so we'll probably appear once a month. Uh, so if you have any more questions, feel free to write to us in the forum that we already have. Uh, so either me or my two TAs will get back to you as quickly or as best we can. And you know, we'll see you again. I think we'll see you again next month. So we'll just come to you with interaction in the times to come as well. So thank you again for appearing, and I'll see you again soon. Thank you.